Hi. Um, there are three things really to know about me. Uh, the first is that I'm a story collector. The second is that I'm a native New Yorker. I grew up in Queens. Yeah. And the third is that I'm a map maker who is always lost. Really, I, people will spin me around and ask me which way is north and I will inevitably point to whichever is in front of my nose. Um, and to give sort of a context for exactly how lost I am, there's an Aboriginal tribe in Australia, in Queensland, and their language has no word for egocentric directions, so left and right don't exist for them. So if you were to do a dance class in their language, you couldn't move your left foot, you would be asked to move your north foot or your west foot, depending on where you were facing. Um, but for me, my world, the closest I've come to being able to share it with people is this map, which is of the geotagged location of Flickr and Picasso photos. Um, these were all of the photos t geotagged uh, in 2011, and Eric Fisher organized all of these. Um, and you can see these landmarks emerge from it. Union Square has a high density, Washington Square Park, et cetera, et cetera. Um, my world is similar to this map without the base map, this one, where a place only exists if there's been an emotional tag or a memory or an experience attached to it. My world doesn't include places that exist between those spots. And so my talk here tonight is a little bit about how this girl who's always lost became a map maker, but also about what this kind of lostness might show us about the places where we live. Um, so my story starts my senior year of high school when we read this book called Invisible Cities by Italo Calvino, which is a conversation between Marco Polo and Kublai Khan. And Marco Polo, the Venetian explorer, is telling Kublai Khan about all of these beautiful cities that he'd been to in Kublai Khan's empire. And he tells of cities that smell like elephants after the rain or cities where desire is already a memory. And Kublai Khan at the end of it says, why have you never told me about your hometown? Why have you never told me about Venice? And Marco Polo looks at Kublai Khan and he says, well, I've been doing nothing but that. And you can take that in one of two ways. You can either see it that every city you see is always seen through the lens of your hometown. Or you can take it like I like to take it, which is that each of these portraits, as contradictory as they were, were actually Venice just from different points of view. And my English teacher, we, we were talking about it on the very last day of high school. My English teacher looks at all of us and he says, you can come back to Stuyvesant where I went to high school, but you will never, ever be able to visit the invisible city that you're leaving today. And everyone starts crying. But it really, it started me thinking about a city as dynamic in two very fundamental ways. One was that a city is simultaneously the sort of emergent phenomenon of everyone's perspective. That's simultaneously true. But also those particular perspectives were ephemeral that even for the person for whom they were subjectively true in that moment, that would fade over time too. Um, so cut to a year later. It's summer after my freshman year of college. And I was hired to be the writer for the travel guide to accompany a map of all of the public art in Manhattan. And I get to my job. And the very first day, my boss says, yeah, you can start writing as soon as the map is done. And I was like, what do you mean? And she's like, well, she takes me over to the computer, and she opens a file in InDesign, and the file immediately shuts down InDesign. The whole thing self-destructs. Um, and it was just like corrupt, and it was too big, and it was three years of interns not communicating with each other. And she looks at me, and she's like, well, you can start writing as soon as you finish that. And so I spent three months trying to make this map, trying to complete this map. And she gave me three objectives. One was that the map needed to be as beautiful as a poster. The second was that it needed to be thorough. We had 1,500 pieces of artwork and she wanted every single one on there with thumbnails of the image. And the third was that she wanted it as accurate as possible. And she used her counterexample, the subway map, which we've seen multiple times tonight, the subway map of New York, where Staten Island is like the Alaska of the map. Um, but Manhattan itself also is totally distorted. And for someone like me who's always lost, this is more than just a map of New York, this is New York for me. And she was like, well, we don't want it distorted like this. And the New York Times, a few years ago, when they redid the map, ran a really interesting comparison of the way Manhattan's shape has changed over time. So if we look at it, starting in 1939, 
that big number in bold is the height to width ratio that that map in that particular year had had. 2010 is the latest one, it's 2.3. The actual height to width ratio of Manhattan is 4.2. It's about 85% fatter than it actually is in this map. But more than that, Inwood is shrunk and downtown is expanded. And it's not wrong. The reason why it does that is because there are many more subway lines in downtown than there are uptown. And so it's a useful map because of the way it selectively filters reality. But it's a filter. And I, I guess I had never realized that until that moment. But even so, I tried to make the map of the public art that summer as accurate and as thorough and as complete as possible. And so I made this disaster of a map. <laughs> it, it's, hardly legible, but it did everything that she'd asked me to do. Um, even in the zoom in, it's really hard to parse. But I was still making subjective decisions. If my map was about public art, I needed to define what public art was. Um, and I was making decisions every day about whether the art in public schools or the art in hospitals counts as public, or whether a carousel should be put on the map, whether it's art. And I realized that a map even if its intention is to be complete and thorough, is still subjective. A map is by definition a filter. And as I, I was cleaning up my desk one of those days, I had come across these napkins that I had drawn to get from work to dinner or to a show because I am so lost. Um, and these maps in series, I realized, told the story of my life that summer. They were the story of my invisible city of Manhattan. But more than that, more than this giant map that I'd been slaving over, it told a story of Manhattan as it's actually lived and it's actually experienced. And so I was motivated to, instead of having me be the sole cartographer of this giant map, to distribute the role of cartographer to as many people as I possibly could and to have them celebrate, not try to hide the subjectivity of the map maker because it's inevitable anyway. And maybe in series, their maps would show Manhattan as it actually exists. And so I designed with my friend Dan Ashwood this schematic diagram of Manhattan where you only see the outline of the island, you have a little bit of Roosevelt Island, you have Broadway that runs all the way north-south, Houston and Central Park. Those are the three I chose because of the way they orient themselves around the grid. Um, and I had it addressed to my PO box and it had instructions uh, which were purposefully sort of ambiguous. It said maps are more about their makers than the places they describe map who you are, map where you are, map the first snowfall or your favorite cup of coffee, map the invisible, map the obvious, map your memories. And I letterpress printed these because if a map is a filter, the goal of it is to make people stop and think about what's noise and what's essence. And so I wanted these letterpress printed maps to actually be the objects that force people to take the time to reflect on their life in the city. And so I spent hours printing these maps and I folded each one and I stamped each one and I had the idea that I wanted to turn Manhattan into a scavenger hunt. And so I folded the maps and attached a crayon and I put an awl through it and I threaded it with a ribbon and it was like this beautiful little package and I wrote, you found it. And I had this notebook where I diagrammed or I, I charted the name or the number of the map, the name of the crayon color and where I dropped each of these maps. So I had like the basement of the Waldorf or in the back of a taxi or in copies of Catcher in the Rye in Barnes and Noble. Um, and I dropped about 300 of these maps. And of them, none of them came back. Um, one kind of did, it's this one. And it says, you were holding my hand and looking at me with those beautiful big eyes of yours and there was only us and I knew my love for you was without measure, without punctuation, and with all my being which is beautiful, except that one didn't actually come back. It was scanned and sent to me because it was a present to her girlfriend. She had found it on the High Line and she gave it to her girlfriend and she was like, I can't part with it. <laughs> and I wanted these physical maps back. And I thought about it because there was one moment actually where I was trying to hide a map, and I think in a pair of boots in, in the Lower East Side. And the store owner caught me and I sort of like slink back up and I have a conversation with her about the project. I tell her about why I want these maps, about what I'm hoping to see. And we talk a little bit about her New York. And a week later, her map comes back. I remember because it said macaroni and cheese. That was the Crayola crayon color. Um, but there was something special in that story that we had. There was, we had created our own memory. We had created an investment in each other, which compelled her to share her own story of Manhattan that started before I ever entered the picture. 
And so I realized that if I wanted these maps back, I would probably have to have these moments of interaction with people. And so I wanted to hand out these maps by walking down Manhattan. And I realized the street that would be most valuable for this journey would be Broadway. It starts all the way up in Marble Hill, which is actually connected to the mainland. Then you go over the Broadway Bridge, through Inwood, all the way to the Upper West Side, all the way down to the Financial District, 13.6 miles down. And Broadway is a really interesting cross-section of New York, where it's kind of a conveyor belt, but you pass by all of these currents in New York. Because New York is a place that's so big, you can sort of feel like your world, as small as it is, is the thorough understanding of New York. But I wanted to cut into as many different ones of those as possible. And also to travel down south through Broadway is to travel back in time. There's a place, Broadway used to end at Ann Street, like right where, the city, where city hall is. Um, and Ann Street to Chambers Street used to be this rope walk where rope was stretched and twisted into the rope that would be used for ships. And all the way uptown, Broadway was this old Native American trail. Anyway, so to follow it was to go back in time, which was entirely in the spirit of the project. So I laced up my sneakers and I went all the way up to Marble Hill and I had my backpack, which I have over here now, um, and I had a shoebox full of maps and I'm wearing the same bracelet. Um, and I went up to people and I held out the map and I just looked for anyone really who looked open. People wearing headphones were kind of off limits because they wouldn't stop. And I would say as quickly as I possibly could, I'm doing a public art project because if I could change skepticism, to confusion, I'd buy myself a few seconds. And I'd open up the, the map, and I'd show them the really sort of familiar outlines of Manhattan. And I'd flip it around and show them the, the stamp, which really confused them, because I was giving them something essentially with money on it. They could just take it and sort of take it off. Um, but they realized, I think somewhere along the lines, that I was just asking them to share their Manhattan. And I really got them, if I could change their confusion, to curiosity. Um, and I handed out hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of maps by walking down Broadway. I handed it to a musician in front of Barnes & Noble or to a security guard right north of Columbia University or to people sitting on the steps of Lincoln Center. I remember there was this one guy also by Lincoln Center who was sort of rummaging through the garbage trying to collect the recyclable cans. And I saw that he had a pen in his pocket and I asked him if he'd be willing to make a map of New York or Manhattan. And he looked at me and he was like, can I have two maps so I can keep one? And I said, of course. Or there was another woman who, she was really not happy when I accosted her. Um, and she said, sure, I'll, I'll make a map of Manhattan, I guess. Um, and I keep explaining and I give her the prompt. I say, map your f favorite cup of coffee over your first snowfall. And she's looking still sort of skeptically at me. And then she pauses and she says, 1936. I say, what? And she says, my first snowfall. She takes a map and she walks away. Um, and unlike the first time, these maps did come back. They came back mapping Manhattan in pools of fear and relief. Or they mapped Manhattan. This one says, it's hard to read. Uh, but the second paragraph says, a decade ago, I moved to Manhattan and I have attained a happiness and satisfaction with who, what, and where I am that in my previous 30 years I never thought possible. And he counters feeling comfortable being gay in New York versus where he came from in Connecticut. Some mapped growing uptown. Um, one that's not here is a woman who documents where she earned her PhD and where she did her postdoc research, and then all the places where she earned the money to pay for that tuition, working in an escort agency or working in a BDSM dungeon, which she had to quit because she found herself too nice. Um, or some simply mapped where they met their wife. And I really love that one because that one, more than anything, really celebrates the fact that a map is a filter like I, I saw earlier in my internship. And looking at these maps and reflecting on not just what came back, but also the distribution technique that was necessary to get these maps in the first place, I was remi reminded a lot of the idea of social friction, which is a term that social scientists use a lot to describe those moments where maybe you catch somebody's eye when there's a rat on the tracks or um, that interaction when somebody's struggling to get their stroller up the stairs and you stop and you talk to them and you help them up. Um, and it comes up a lot in research about whether people are happier in cities or in suburbs. And they did some research in Grand Central about exactly those tiny little moments of acute but ephemeral connection. And they found that those moments, as fleeting as they are, actually are sustaining and they do make people happy in cities. 
And I was thinking about this and thinking about the fact that I needed to have these interactions with strangers in order to get their maps and that the maps, as diverse as they were, were mapping these intense moments of personal experience in the city, of connection or of disconnection or of alienation. And I realized that the invisible cities that I was getting back were these invisible cities of emotion. Um, and that if I were to get a map, a complete map of Manhattan, it isn't that I'm trying to map a fixed coordinate like I was trying to do with the public art project or like Alan Leidner tried to do in 2000 when he mapped all of the infrastructure of New York. But that because a city is, as we've been talking about, not a fixed coordinate but an evolving relationship between a place and its inhabitants, in order to try to capture a city in a map, it's really a series of portraits of the place from very particular points of view that, like this, the portrait of Stuyvesant that I could never return to, might only be true for the instant that the map maker makes. But in that instant and in this series, you get the city as it actually is living and it actually is lived. Um, and so I looked back at this map, which is by the same person, the Flickr map. This one is instead a map of geotagged tweets. So for any user who tweeted two things in a row with geotags, his algorithm drew a line between the tweets. And it's cheating a little bit because the tweets run through the path where other tweets have been geotagged, which is why retail things are highlighted more. But what I love about this map is that it highlights Broadway as the main artery and it makes the entirety of New York look kind of like a heart because that's sort of what I felt like I was mapping at the end of it all, the heart of the city. And so I wanted to end with this final map, which is called Ava is here, I, I called it that. Um, but the map maker included a note with her map and she said that she knew she wanted to make a map that included her late sister, um, but that she struggled for a long time about what exactly to include in the map until she realized that the problem wasn't that it was, or the problem was that she thought Ava, her sister, was the only person in the map, but really it was that her whole family should be in it because the city is experienced by her as her family, as a, a unit of four. And she writes that um, she loves the city and she experiences the city and that the city courses through them, through their veins and carries them on like a city, or carries them on like a river, I'm sorry. Um, and she says, so here we are, we are the city and the city is us. And I think these tiny invisible cities, these tiny little moments of emotional connection in series is the way that I have come to understand Manhattan.